And so this is going to be mostly for the US. And so in particular, one of the things that we can talk in more detail at the end are what are the implications of some of the things that I'm going to be discussing today for European countries. And I think that that might be of interest to, to many of you, both in terms of like whether these models also apply to Europe and the empirical strategy that we are developing here can also be applied to European countries. So I think that that's kind of like an interesting area for discussion at the end. So anyway, the, in this paper, this is joint work uh, with, with Daron Ashimoglu, and we are trying to think about how technology affects wage inequality in the US. So let me start by providing some of the facts that we're going to be thinking about during this presentation. So this figure, which I took from David Autor's Eli lecture, shows cumulative wage growth since 1963 until 2017 for men in the left panel and for women in the right panel. And this is also separated by level of education. So those are the lines in different colors. And what you can see is that from the 1960s until the 1980s, we had an era of essentially healthy wage growth for all groups of society. Men, women, independent of their level of education, they all benefit benefited from technological progress in terms of growth in the real wages. However, after the 1980s, you start seeing a very different pattern. You see a fanning out of the wage distribution. So you continue to see healthy wage growth at the top for highly educated men and women, especially those with a post-college degree, a master's or a PhD. But for the rest of the population, you start seeing stagnant or in many cases, and especially for men in the left panel, decreasing real wages. So this is actually quite striking because despite all of the technological advances that we've had since the 1980s, there are some groups of society that actually measured in terms of the real weekly wages are worse off than similar workers were in the 1980s. So this is quite remarkable. And in this presentation, we wanna think about the role that technology might have played behind these trends. So in particular, what I'm going to argue is that many of these changes in the wage structure that we have seen since the 1980s are better understood as the effects or as the uneven effects of automation technologies on some groups of society. And in particular, the way in which automation technologies work is by substituting a specific groups of workers at some of the tasks that they used to perform. So think of these men without a college degree that were employed as welders in manufacturing. And now you have essentially a robot that can do the welding. So in effect, this is going to displace these workers from these tasks. And this displacement effect is always going to reduce the relative wages of the displaced groups. And we are going to see that in some cases, it can also reduce the real wages of those groups, as we've seen in the data. This is going to generate growth. So the economy is going to grow in terms of output per worker, but still, this increase in output per worker is going to come at the expense of some of those groups that are getting displaced. So we're going to get very strong distributional consequences. So that's what I want to argue today. And I want to emphasize that this view that this is really about a displacement effect of automation that is affecting some groups of society and not others is very different from traditional canonical skill bias, technical change narratives or models. So in those models, the general idea is that new technologies complement skill labor. So in particular, if you go back, for example, to the Katz and Murphy seminal paper, the idea there is that we produce output using high skill labor and low skill labor. And what technology does is that it's just making high skill labor more productive over time. And that increases inequality. But our story is very different because our story is about technology substituting in the lower end of the skill distribution. And we are going to see that this can have very different implications for real wages and also for inequality. And in particular, one key takeaway that I want to start emphasizing since now is that actually if the whole story was about technology complementing skilled labor, things wouldn't be that bad. Because from the perspective of low-skilled workers, any technology that complements skilled labor actually increases their wages because it is as if they had more skilled workers to work with. 
And so that's something that we're going to see in the model in a second. Whereas automation technologies are very different because automation technologies can reduce your own wages, which is something that I think is a salient feature in the data. So in this presentation and in this paper, we are going to make precise the argument by developing a task model that is going to allow us to study the effects of automation on wages. The main insight of this model is what I already said, that the changes in the real wages of a group, think again of men without a college degree, is going to be linked to the extent to which this group has been displaced from their tasks by automation technologies. And this is what we call the task displacement affecting that group. So all you need to know is how many tasks has each group lost to automation. And in our model, that's going to summarize the distributional implications of these types of technologies. Of course, this is only important if we actually have a way of measuring this task displacement, of knowing how many tasks has each group of society lost to automation. So in the second part of the paper, I'm going to develop a method to measure this task displacement across different groups of societies. In particular, we're going to come up with a measure of men with no college and of certain ages, how many tasks have they lost to automation? Women with no college and certain ages, how many tasks have they lost to automation? And we're going to have these measures available for 500 demographic groups. And then we are going to show that indeed, as expected from our model, it is true that in the data, it is precisely those groups that have experienced the greatest task displacement, the ones that are experiencing lower wage growth in the last four years. So that's kind of like suggesting that the key mechanism model is operating. And then finally, and this is something that we do on the paper, and I'm not going to emphasize it as much today, maybe at the end I'll do a quick summary, is that we can also take this evidence, because this is essentially reduced form evidence, and put it inside our model to kind of like quantify in a general equilibrium sense how important is automation in explaining all of the observed wage changes? And the number that we get out of that exercise is that automation explains 50 to 70% of the changes in the US wage structure across demographic groups that we've seen since the 1980s. So it's a key force explaining that fanning out of the wage distribution. And importantly, this exercise also shows that even though automation is generating all of this inequality, it only increased TFP, total factor productivity, since 1980 by about 4% in cumulative terms. So that's quite a small effect. So essentially, we have here a technology that can generate very adverse distributional effects, but is not growing the pie as much as to compensate the losers. And that's why you see wages falling at the bottom of the distribution. If automation generated huge productivity gains, then it would also bring inequality, but it wouldn't be as worrying because it would benefit everyone. But because it brings only a small productivity gains, it becomes more of a concern, especially for those workers that are getting displaced. So that's the basic idea. And actually before, the first thing that I'm gonna do in the presentation is walk you through the model. Then we are gonna see the evidence on how to measure task displacement and whether this task displacement measure really predicts wage declines across demographic groups. And then at the end, I'll conclude by briefly summarizing the quantitative exercise. But yeah, before I jump to the content, I see that there's one question right now. And there's this is also like a great point to ask for any clarifying question. Uh, yes. Hello. Yeah. Hello. Um, I, I would like to ask one question really quick to clarify. Um, so uh, is the part about the rising relative productivity of the highly skilled negligible, in your opinion, or are you just not focusing on that? In your yep. paper. So that's, that's a great question. So you're going to see that actually in the data, there's evidence that that's also happening. So we cannot explain all of the increase in wages happening at the top. So for example, if you go to this picture, you see that wages at the top are rising quite rapidly. And our model is not going to be able to explain that. So I think mm -hmm. that what that means is that there, there are some other forms of technological change that have made skilled workers more productive that are different from automation. Okay. And you can start thinking about very skilled workers, for example, using computers and so on. And that's something that we are not going to have in the model. So yeah. I wouldn't say that it's negligible. It's just that that it's not our focus. We are kind of okay. like focusing on what's happening at the lower end. Okay, thank you. 
Any other questions before we jump to the content? OK, great. So to fix ideas, and this is kind of like all of the model. I like it because it fits in, in one slide. So I'm going to introduce a model where the key idea is that production requires different tasks. These tasks need to be allocated to workers with different skills. But increasingly over time, firms are also having the option of performing these tasks in an automated way using specialized equipment, capital, software, or robots. And so think, for example, of a car manufacturing plant. In order to produce a car, you need to complete many tasks. You need to design the car. You need to unload the parts. You need to assemble the parts, weld them together. Then you need to paint the car. Then you need to coat the painting. Then you need to sell the car, and so on. And each of these tasks has to be produced by workers of different skills. But increasingly, if you go to a car manufacturing plant, you're going to see that the welding is no longer being done by workers. It's been done by robots. And the sales, actually, it's not being done by workers. It's been done by some software that is putting on the advertisement, and so on. And so this is the phenomenon that we are trying to capture with this model. And we are trying to understand how those changes affect the wages of different skill groups in society. So to capture this, I'm going to assume that we are in an economy that produces a final good Y, think of cars, by combining a mass M of tasks. And each task is going to be indexed by X. So each of these Xs are one of the tasks that I mentioned earlier in the example of the car manufacturing plant. And then the tasks are combined with a constant elasticity of substitution lambda. So that's a CES aggregator over tasks. And the quantity of task x is just yx. Now, the interesting bit is the equation. So sorry, I forgot to mention that lambda is the elasticity of substitution across tasks. So you can imagine that lambda is a small number because in order to produce a task, a car, sorry, all tasks are going to be highly complementary in the production of the car. Now, the key equation is the one in the middle, which tells us how can the economy complete different tasks? So this is telling us that in order to produce task X, we have several options. We can produce that task using one of different types of workers. So these different worker types are indexed by G. So think of G as denoting one of the categories of workers that we saw in the initial figure. So G can be men without a college degree or young women without a college degree or older workers with a post-college degree. So each of these G is kind of like a demographic group. And each demographic group has certain productivity across tasks. So they, can, they have a comparative advantage at certain tasks. So that's captured by the Psi GX which gives the productivity of workers of type G in task X. In addition, each skill group has a total productivity AG. So this AG captures the usual factor of mentoring technologies. These are technologies that are making this group more productive across all tasks. So going back to the discussion on Arata that we were having earlier, this could be any technology that, for example, makes skill workers more productive at everything that they do. And that's not going to be our focus in the quantitative exercise, but that's the traditional way that we thought about technology. And finally, LGX is the quantity of workers from group G that are allocated to task X. Now, of course, you can also produce the tasks with capital. So that means that I can also produce the task with some capital that is specifically designed to accomplish that task. So that's the first term. That capital is going to have a overall productivity AK and a task specific productivity Psi KX. So the Psi KX here tells us how good is capital at that specific task. There are tasks in which capital is great. Capital has a comparative advantage. So think of everything that requires a lot of strength. So of course we wanna use a crane to move things in docks because that's a task that capital is great at doing. But there are also tasks in which capital is not very good at. So think of more interpersonal things that really require kind of like a human touch. So all of that is captured by the Psi KX. This is giving us the comparative advantage of capital. Now, of course, this Psi KX might be changing over time due to advances in, in technology, right? So Anna, I think that you have a question. Yes, there is a question on the chat, which I will yes. just read. Uh, it's about a 
about the year 1981. Is there any specific change around this year so mm -hmm. that automation and wages can be linked uh, to this year? Yeah, absolutely. So, so actually, in our empirical exercise, we're going to start the effects around mm -hmm. that year. I don't think that there's anything specific about that year. I mean, for some reasons, it is true that wages fall a lot during that year, but I don't think that I mean, it's it's kind of like across the place. So it's more like a macroeconomic effect at that point in time. But but yeah, most of these technologies start arriving in the 1980s. And most of that happens because of the huge decline in computing prices. So as computing gets cheaper, it allows you to develop these technologies where you can use that computing power to automate more tasks. And that's how we are thinking about it. That's kind of like what changed in the 1980s. It's not that like in 1981, all of the technologies were available, but but started at that point. And, and you can see, for example, that industrial robots, which is kind of like a very nice example of an automation technology, they really start getting adopted and developed around that year as well. Okay. So where do firms get these factors? Well, they can hire workers at a competitive wage that is going to be group specific. All the supply of labor of type G is going to be fixed at LG. So here we are not going to be entertaining the possibility that people can acquire new skills and go to college in response to technology. Certainly that's an important margin, but we're not going to be modeling it. But you know, like I can tell you what how things would change if you added that. Um, now, but labor is perfectly flexible across tasks, right? So you can relocate labor from one task to the other. That's perfectly fine. Now, what about capital? Capital needs to be produced from the final good. And in particular, there's going to be a cost of producing the capital that is required to complete task X. So given these assumptions, an equilibrium is just an allocation of tasks to factors that maximizes output. So think of the car manufacturing plant again, what the car manufacturing plant is doing is that it looks at all of its tasks. It looks at the cost of producing each task with workers. It looks at the cost of producing each task with capital and it just goes for the cheapest factor. And that determines how the plant is going to allocate these tasks across workers or a uh, machinery. And then changes in technology can change that allocation with implications for wages that I'm going to describe in a second. So one nice way of thinking about it is imagine that this balloon here it's kind of like the set of all of the tasks in the economy. And an equilibrium of this model is just an allocation. So some tasks go to workers of group G. Some tasks go to capital. So those are the tasks here at the bottom. And some tasks go to workers G prime. But of course, you can have many groups. And this can be kind of like, like this looks now like a bubble. But this can be like any crazy set in general. The important thing is that given the supply of labor and given technology, there's a unique equilibrium allocation. Now, given this allocation, I'm going to define one object that is going to be the key object helping us understand how technology affects wages. We call that object the task share of group G, this gamma G that I have there. And the definition is that this is just the integral over the set of tasks performed by group G of the importance of that task in the production process. So essentially, the task share captures the mass or the importance of the tasks that your group gets to perform in the economy. We can also define task shares for each of the groups, and we can also define task shares for capital. So again, imagine that essentially is if I had like perfect data, in principle, I would be able to make a list of all of the tasks that are performed by men without a college degree. And I could keep track of how this list is changing over time. And we're going to see that understanding how that list changes over time is going to tell us something about the wages of that group. OK, so this is the key result. We can show that in this model, we can represent output as a CES function of the different types of labor. So remember that I started with a CES production function of tasks, but now I've shown you that this aggregates to a CES production function in terms of workers. Now, there are two, well, there are three key differences with a typical CES. Let me go through them. The first and most important difference is that if you look at the CES shares, 
So many times when we write down CS production functions, we actually ignore these terms because we tend to think that they're kind of like exogenous. But in our model, the CS shares are going to be endogenous and they are given by the task shares. So the task shares determine the weight of each group in the production function. So that's result number one, or the importance of each group in the production process. Now, the second difference is that you might be tempted to conclude that the elasticity of substitution between these types of workers is lambda because it looks like a CES with an elasticity of substitution lambda. But it turns out that in general equilibrium, the elasticity of substitution is going to be sigma g, which is greater than lambda. And the reason is that when a worker becomes expensive, you have two margins of adjustment. First, you can demand less of the task that the worker produces, that's lambda, but also you can relocate tasks away from the work. So that gives you an extra margin of adjustment. And that's why the elasticity of substitution is going to exceed lambda. And finally, there's this weird looking term here at the front. This is just capturing this one minus AK. So this is just capturing the fact that capital is produced from the final good. And so the, com the economy is roundabout. And so this is capturing the extra output that you get from the roundaboutness of production. Now, let's go to the most interesting part, wages, because the objective of this model is to understand how wages are determined. So this is a competitive economy, and therefore wages are given by the marginal product of each type of worker. And we can compute this marginal product here. It turns out that wages are given by output per unit of labor to the one over lambda times the productivity level of that type of worker times the task share of those workers. And in this equation, you can already start seeing how this model is gonna work. So in particular, if you start thinking of a technological change that reduces the task share of group G, that is gonna lower the weight of that group in production, which is gonna lower their wages and therefore could reduce the real wages, and it's always going to reduce their relative wages. So that's the key mechanism that we have in mind. Finally, and this is going to be important for the measurement part, in this economy, the labor share is inversely related to the task share of capital. And this makes sense. If I allocate more tasks to capital, the labor share in the production process is going to go down because workers are going to become less important in production. So in this economy, if we see the labor share of an industry or a firm decreasing very rapidly, that's going to be a telltale sign that there's a lot of automation, that this firm or this industry is reorganizing its production and shifting tasks from labor to capital. So let me explain how automation works in this world. Imagine that we are back in the initial equilibrium that I showed you earlier. So we have this balloon, which represents all of the tasks in the economy. And some of the tasks were allocated to group G. Some of the tasks were allocated to group G prime. And some of the tasks were allocated to capital. And now let's consider the following thought experiment. Let's imagine that capital becomes more productive at some of the tasks that were previously allocated to group G. So think that, for example, right now, the tasks of doing research and teaching are allocated to humans, right? We are doing them. But imagine that there's a development in artificial intelligence that allows computers to perform these tasks much more effectively or at a lower cost than we do. What's going to happen? Well, we are going to get displaced from these two tasks, right? And so that's what we call the task displacement effect. The task displacement effect is the loss in tasks by group G that happens because capital directly outcompetes this group in some set of tasks over time. And this happens because of technological advances in capital. Capital becomes better at those tasks. Know that this is very different from what would happen if capital became better at tasks that capital was already producing. So if cranes become better cranes, that is not going to affect any worker because you are not displacing anyone. Automation happens when capital becomes better than humans 
a task that humans were producing. Okay, so that's how we define and how we think about automation. So this is going to generate several effects. The first effect is that group G in this example is going to lose a mass of tasks that we are going to call D log gamma GD. So this is the percentage loss in task share due to the direct effects of automation. We are going to see that this is the key object that summarizes the effects of automation on this group. And I'm going to show you how to measure this object in a couple of slides. Now, of course, this is not the end of the story. Imagine, going back to the example, that this software displaces us from teaching and research. Well, we are not going to stay idle. We are going to go and we are going to do something else at that point, right? So maybe some of us would become politicians or some of us would become consultants, or some of us will become, I don't know, yoga instructors, who know, like the sky's the limit. So at that point, we are gonna start competing with other groups for some of the tasks that they were previously producing. So you can see this happening in many contexts. So workers that get displaced from manufacturing start driving an Uber and start competing against the immigrants who were driving the cabs. So that's another example of these effects. We're going to refer to this as ripple effects. So ripple effects are the changes in the boundaries of the task allocation that happen in response to automation. The implication is that not only those workers who are directly exposed to automation are affected, but also workers who are in competition against those workers for tasks are affected. So you don't have to be displaced yourself. If people in finance get displaced by AI trading algorithms and they start becoming professors, that's also going to push our wages down. And this is what the ripple effects are capturing. In a big part of the presentation, I'm going to ignore ripple effects, but I'll get back to them at the end. Because if we want to understand how technology affects all groups, we need to understand also competition between these groups, because that determines who ends up bearing the incidence of a shock that is hitting some groups in the economy. Finally, not all is bad news. Of course, this is technological progress. So there's also some productivity gains. In particular, we show in the paper that you can compute the productivity gains from automation as the share of the group that is getting displaced in GDP. So that's kind of like the wage share times the direct displacement effect, this is the mass of tasks that the group lost to technology, that is the orange area, times the cost saving gains generated by automation in those tasks. So let's go back to the example of AI algorithms that can do research and teaching. To a first order approximation, if you want to understand the contribution of those algorithms to TFP growth, all we have to do is to compute the share of research and education in the economy. So that's going to be like, I don't know, 3%, 5%, some number around that, and multiply that by the reduction in cost created by those algorithms. So in particular, if the algorithms are 30% cheaper than an assistant professor, then the TFP gains from that is going to be 5%, which is the share of education and research in the economy, times 30%, which is the cost savings from the technology. So you can see that essentially this is going to add up to a small number. You can essentially substitute all of the assistant professors. And if you don't get a huge cost saving gains, the TFP gains from that is just going to be something like zero point. Well, let me actually do the calculation. 0.3% of TFP, right? Something along those lines. Well, let, let me actually do it right. 3%. Well, I'll get back to you with the exact number, but 5% times 1.5%, that's a small number, right? Okay, good. So let me summarize this with a formula and then. I'll present an extension of this formula and then we'll jump to the empirical exercise. So to summarize, we can express changes in the wages of a group as a sum of four factors. Factor one is something that we call the productivity effect. So this is the expansion of GDP in the economy, okay? So you can see that this depends entirely on how much output is expanding. And this is capturing the nice side of technology. 
when technology improves, we expand output and that increases everyone wages. Now, technology not only expands output, but also creates distributional effects. So for example, factor augmenting technologies, they tend you to make, to make you more productive and that's good for your wages because typically we tend to think that the elasticity of substitution for the goods and services that you produce is greater than one. So everything that makes you more productive is going to increase your wages. So that's this term right here. And that's the typical channel emphasized in the literature. So there's technology making skilled labor more productive that's gonna increase their wages, okay? Here is the channel that we are emphasizing here. And you can see that it will always come to a negative sign. You're also gonna lose in terms of relative wages when you get displaced from more tasks. And in particular, this is just a function of what's the share of tasks that you lost. That's all you need to know in order to quantify what is the effect of this direct effect from task displacement on your wages. And finally, you have the ripple effects. So the ripple effects imply that it is no longer the case that your wages depend on what's happening to you, but it's also going to depend on what's happening to people that are in close competition against you. And so you can think of these ripple effects as kind of like summarizing how wages of all of your competitors are changing because of technology. And I'll get back to that at the end of the presentation, but for the time being, I'm kind of like going to ignore these ripple effects and focus on the direct effects of technology. Finally, one thing that is incomplete here is, well, you might ask, well, what's the expansion of output? Because the expansion of output is telling us something about how big are the productivity gains from technology. Well, it turns out that the expansion of output depends on the effects of technology on TFP. And I already argued that the productivity gains from automation can be quite small. On the other hand, the productivity gains from technology that augment one worker are always going to be large because you're making that worker more productive across the board. So to some degree, factor augmenting technologies are good because they create small distributional effects, especially when this elasticity of substitution is close to one, which is kind of like what most of the literature estimates, and large productivity gains. So these are technologies that generate share prosperity. Everyone benefits essentially. Instead, automation technologies that are mostly about displacing one specific groups can have adverse implications for that group, large distributional effects coming from these direct displacement effects and can generate small productivity gains. So conceptually, that's kind of like the main difference between these two technologies. And that's how we see the change be between the period before the 80s and the period after the 80s. So we are thinking that before the 80s, most of the technology was factor augmenting, was improvement in material sciences and so on that really augmented humans. And after the 80s, there has been an emphasis more on automation technologies. And that's why you see this increase in inequality, even though you're not seeing a boom in productivity. Now, in order to take this equation to the data, I just have to do one small modification. In this economy that I just show you, I thought about the production of a single good. But in reality, we have multiple industries. And this is important because automation concentrates in some specific industries. So for example, there's much more automation in manufacturing than in some sectors in services. So we need to account for that. So in particular, we can extend the framework to a multi-sector economy. And what we can show there is that you get a very similar equation for wages, but now there are two differences. The first difference is that you have this term capturing industry shifts. So in particular, if you're in a multi-sector economy and industries in which you have a comparative advantage expand as a share of value added, that's good for you because that's increasing the demand for the types of skills that you have. So that's what this term right here is capturing. So you might think of things such as trade in final goods or in general structural transformation as affecting the wage structure through these industry shifters. So that's the first modification. And the second modification is that now the displacement that you experience across all industries matters. So it's not only about how much displacement do you experience in a single industry, because we're assuming that labor is perfectly mobile across tasks. So if I get displaced in a single industry, I can still go and move to the next industry. So what matters in this case is a measure of the total direct task displacement that you experience across industries. And this is going to be an average of the displacement that you experience in each of the industries. And the weights here are just the share of wages that your group 
earns in industry I, which tells us how important is industry I for the wages of your group or for the labor demand of your group. So this is the equation that I'm gonna estimate in my reduced form exercise. In particular, I'm gonna take data for different groups and I'm gonna try to explain their wages as a function of a constant. The constant is capturing the productivity effect. Technology is improving, increasing output and that benefits all of us. I gonna explain wages as a function of factor aumenting technologies. So I'm gonna proxy this with educational dummies. So the idea is that there are technologies that are making, for example, people with a college degree more productive over time or people with a post-college degree more productive over time. And on Orata, I think that this is going to be an area where you're going to see the, that there's a residual component that our measure doesn't explain. We are also going to control for measures of these industry shifters. So in particular, trade and many other forces have changed the composition of the U.S. economy and have moved the economy more towards services. So that can affect wages, and we are going to control for that effect. But most importantly, we are going to try to measure this term right here. We are going to try to measure for each group was the total direct task displacement that the group has experienced across all industries. And the theory suggests that that term should come out as negative and should play an important role in explaining wages across groups or changes in wages across groups over time. Okay. So this is all I'm gonna say about the theory. Please, if there's any question about it, let me know. And otherwise we can jump to the empirical exercise. Anna, go ahead. I actually have a question because you mentioned that there is uh, so little improvement in <clears throat> productivity. So this is something which was measured or it's an assumption or what, what is it? Because for me, yep. it would be uh, illogical why, why the companies use this mm -hmm. uh, task mm -hmm. displacement, displacement mm -hmm. technologies if they bring so little increase in productivity or so little savings. Absolutely, absolutely. So that's a great question. So let's look at this formula again. And this time I'll, I'm gonna try to make the calculation easier for me. So if you look at this formula, this is a formula that comes out of the model, right? So essentially the formula is telling you that if you want to automate 10% of the tasks in the economy, and that's essentially what, what we find in the measurement exercise that I'm gonna show you in a second, that 10% of the tasks in the economy has, has been automated in the last 30 years. Then you need to multiply that 10% by this term pi g, which is the cost reduction generated by automation. And this pi g, we actually estimated in another paper using the case of industrial robots, which is not the only automation technology, but it's a very prominent one. And we estimate it to be 30%. So this essentially implies that the TFP gains are 10% times 30%. And now I can make that one in my head, that's 3%. So that implies that TFP goes up by 3% over a 40 year period. So that's a small effect. Now, why are firms adopting the technology? Because from the point of view of the firm, the only thing that matters is the 30%. Mm -hmm. From the firm, it, I'm reducing the cost of producing this task by 30%. But it's just that from an aggregate perspective, all of the cost of that gaining productivity is bared by some specific workers. And the firm doesn't internalize that because the firm only cares about maximizing profit, right? So that's a little bit what's happening here. From the point of view of the firm, profits went up. Like the firm is doing better. It actually reduced its cost, its cost quite a bit, but all of that came at the expense of some groups that were displaced from those tasks. So I think that that's kind of like what makes it more complicated in a way, mm -hmm. which is that this is one example where the incentives of firms and workers can be misaligned. And, and, so, and so perhaps you want firms to internalize the social cost of automation or something like that. And, and that's tricky because they do not necessarily do that. As long as we have an algorithm that can teach at a 10% lower cost than, than we can, then we're not gonna be teaching, right? If, unless we find some ways to like increase our value. But, but, but yeah, as, as long as that's the case, a firm has all of the incentives to substitute us. Um, so I think that that's what's happening here. Yeah, thank you, makes sense. Perfect, good. And by the way, this is kind of like another lesson, which is in, in some of our papers, we call this the so-so automation technology paradox, which is the idea that you can have automation technologies where, that are very mediocre 
in the sense that they do not increase productivity a lot. And those are the worst because they're going to get adopted. They're going to generate displacement, but they're not going to bring productivity. So if you want to be worried, you really need to be worried about these mediocre automation technologies. You don't need to worry about the brilliant automation technologies that have a huge pi G because those increase productivity by a lot. So it's only kind of like the mediocre robots or the mediocre technologies, the ones that, that can reduce uh, some group's wages. And I think that there are some examples of brilliant automation technologies. So for example, like think that like everything that we've done in, in agriculture was like at least in the long run turned out to be brilliant. But for example, check self checkouts in supermarkets, at least here in the US, I think that they make no sense. They save almost no cost. They take a lot of time and I can see no big productivity gains coming from that. And, and the, end, the end result is just like, like, you know, like output remains roughly the same and you just have like fewer workers. So, so that's something that I think it really it just displaces those workers and generates no productivity gains. Okay, but thanks, that, that's a good question. Okay, so now let's go to the more interesting part, which is how do we measure this task displacement and trying to understand whether indeed these measures of task displacement can explain what's happening to different workers over time. So this is our measuring methodology. And in order to make it work, we have to make one single assumption. So let me walk you through this assumption. The assumption is that only routine tasks have been automated in the last 40 years. So that's part one of the assumption. And part two is that all workers displaced from routine tasks in the same industry are being displaced at the same rate. So let me unpack the assumption. The first part is just stating something about the capabilities of new technologies. We are saying these new automation technologies are very good at doing routine tasks because those are tasks that can be easy, easily codified and that follow repetitive procedures. So these are things that are ripe for automation. Of course, there are also non-routine tasks that have been automated, but this is kind of like just an approximation. Note that we do not need all routine tasks to be automated. We just need that only routine tasks have been automated. The second part of the assumption states that if Anna and me are doing the same task in an industry, then when automation comes, we are both getting displaced at the same rate. So the extent to which we get displaced depends on the nature of the tasks that we are doing in that industry and not on our individual identities, okay? So that is important because that is gonna help us apportion all of the improvements in automation taking place in one industry across workers. Like essentially we know that all workers that are doing routine tasks in an industry are equally exposed to automation, okay? So those are, the two things that you need in order to construct this measure. If you make this assumption, we can measure the task displacement experienced by a group of workers over any period of time as a sum across industries of three terms. So the first term, this omega GI, gives us the exposure of that group of workers to industry I. That's just telling us how important is that industry for the labor demand for that. Okay, so that's the first term. The, seco the second term gives us the revealed comparative advantage of that group in routine jobs in industry I. So what's the basic idea? The basic idea is that if there's a lot of automation happening in an industry, and I am the only worker who is doing routine tasks in that industry, then the assumption implies that I'm gonna bear all of the incidents of that automation. If instead there are many workers doing routine tasks, then I'm gonna say that we are all sharing the incidents of that automation. And so less of that falls directly on me. So this is a way of adjusting for the incidence of automation within an industry. This is useful because this is capturing the idea that when I see a lot of automation happening in an industry, not all workers are affected. It is exactly the workers who specialize in routine tasks within that industry, the ones that should be getting displaced. 
It is not the managers and it is not other workers doing non-routine tasks. Finally, we have the orange term, which tells us how much automation or how much task displacement is taking place in each specific industry during this period of time. And in our model, we showed that this is given by the percent decline in the labor share due to automation. Why the decline in the labor share? Because remember that in our model, that is tightly linked to the extent to which tasks are being shifted from workers to capital. So in our model, the labor share decline tells us how big or how important is automation in an industry. Of course, the labor share can be declining for various reasons. And that's why the full statement is that we only need to use the component of the labor share decline that is directly attributable to automation. So how are we going to measure all of these terms? Well, the first two terms, we can directly measure them from the data because I know the share of wages earned by each group of workers across industries. I get that from the census and I guess that from European countries, you can also easily have that data. Uh, the second term also comes from data that has any occupational dimension. So I just need to look at within that industry, what's the share of wages earned by that group in routine tasks. So that's also something that I can measure if I have a definition of routine tasks, and I'm going to show you the one that we used in a second. And the third term is more tricky because that's something that is not directly observable. I can see the decline in the labor share in an industry, but it's harder to argue what's the part of that that is directly due to automation. So we are going to use two strategies. In our first strategy, we are going to use all of the observed decline in the labor share as a measure of automation. Uh, of course, this is just kind of like a benchmarking exercise because there could be other forces explaining the decline in the labor share of an industry, for example, an increase in markups or changes in factor prices or whatnot. So we see this mostly as a benchmarking exercise. Our preferred strategy instead is to use industry level measures of automation, in particular measures of the adoption of robots specialized software and machinery across industries to estimate the component of the labor share decline that can be attributed to these technologies. So I'm going to describe that in more detail in a second, but let me stop here and make sure that there are no questions about the measurement from a conceptual point of view. Okay, good. So this is the data that we're going to use this is data, so, okay, so sorry. So in order to construct these measures, we need data for groups and for industries. So let me describe first the data for industries. We're gonna use 49 industries from the BEA, the Bureau of Economic Analysis from 1987 to 2016. And in this figure, what you can see in blue is the observed labor share decline in percent terms. So a more positive value means that there was a stronger decline in the labor share in that industry, which through the lens of our model points to more automation taking place there. So you can see a big decline in mining. You can see a big decline in car manufacturing, but you can also see that there's a lot of heterogeneity. So when we talk about the decline in the labor share, it's far from uniform across industries. You can see, for example, that in some sectors such as hospitals, we do not see a big decline in the labor share. Professional services, we do not see any decline in the labor share. And actually, in some industries such as agriculture, the labor share has been increasing recently, perhaps because of a movement to organic agriculture or more manual intensive agriculture techniques. So you can see that there's a lot of heterogeneity and our model is telling us, well, this means that the incidence of automation concentrates on very specific sectors. Now, in orange, I'm also plotting the part of the labor share decline across these industries that we can explain with our measures of automation. So in particular, the way that it works is as follows. Imagine that I have data on the labor share decline. So this is plotted here in the vertical axis. And I have proxies of automation, which are plotted here in the horizontal axis across these 49 industries. So essentially what we are doing is that we are running regressions 
of the change in the labor share against our proxies of automation across industries. And you can see that there's a negative relationship between changes in the labor share and the adjusted penetration of robots. This comes from data from the Industrial Federation of Robots for the US. So industries that are adopting more robots experience a bigger decline in the labor share. You can also see that there's a lot of zeros here because this data for robots is only available for manufacturing. Now in panel B, you can see that industries that increase by more their investments in specialized software and in dedicated machinery also experience a bigger drop in their labor shares. And finally, in panel C, what we are doing is that we are pulling these two technologies or these three technologies actually into a single one and explaining the decline in the labor share as you can think as a principal component index of these three technologies. And this gives us the labor share decline predicted by these three technologies. So essentially across industries, we show that these three measures explain 50% of the variation in the labor share decline and give us these orange bars that we have here. So when you focus on the orange bars, you can see that that reduces the heterogeneity a little bit, which is good because presumably some of the industries that are experiencing a big drop in their labor share are doing so for reasons that are uh, unrelated to automation. Now we do not see almost any industry experiencing increases in the labor share because now we are focusing only on automation and automation should reduce the labor share. And you can see that the industry with the greatest predicted decline in the labor share is now car manufacturing, which is kind of like the poster child for automation because you have big use of industrial robots, computers and specialized software and equipment in this industry. So in most of the presentation, I'm gonna focus on our measure of task displacement created by using these orange bars. So these orange bars are telling us how much automation is taking place in each industry. Now, of course, the interesting bit comes from projecting this to different groups of society. So now we are gonna be thinking of 500 groups of workers. They're gonna be defined by their education, uh, their gender, their experience or age, their race, and their place of birth. And we are gonna measure their specialization across industries and routine jobs within an industry using the 1980 US census. So with these measures of initial wage shares and our measure of how much stat displacement is taking place in each industry, we can construct measures of the task displacement experience by these 500 groups. I forgot to mention that we're defining routine jobs using occupations and the measures of routineness from ONET, which follows the work of Daron and David Out. But this is what you get in the right panel. So each of these markers represents one of these 500 groups. The colors indicate educational levels. And the size of the balloon indicates the population in each of these demographic groups. I'm sorting all of these groups in the horizontal axis according to the log of their hourly wages in 1980, so that you can see where in the wage distribution are the effects of automation being felt the most. And in the vertical axis, I now have my measure of task displacement. So remember that this is what's the share of tasks that each of these groups has lost to automation. So you can see that some groups in the middle directly lost 30% of their tasks since 1980 to automation. But you can also see that, for example, groups of highly educated workers at the top experienced essentially no task displacement whatsoever. So they only lost 2% of their tasks or 5% of their tasks, which are, well, less two to 3% of their tasks, which are actually quite small numbers. You can also see that there's a little bit of a U shape, which suggests that automation is going to play both an unequalizing role and also a polarizing role. Equalizing, unequalizing role because people at the bottom of the distribution are more exposed than people at the top and polarizing because people at the middle are slightly more exposed than people at the bottom, though this difference is not gigantic. So we go from 20% to 30%. I also want you to keep in mind that this is only telling us what's the direct displacement that you have experienced. So this is a measure of the shock. 
you've lost 30% of your tasks due to automation. Now, doesn't mean that now you're doing 30% fewer tasks because you can also go and start doing new things. So this is just a measure of how far have you been pushed out by automation, not a measure of the net effect of technology on your task share. But given this measure, we can now ask, well, is it true that these groups that are more exposed to automation have experienced a bigger drop in wages? So this is what this figure does. And I want you to focus on the right panel, which uses the data on the automation-driven decline in the labor share of each industry, which is our preferred specification. In the vertical axis, you have changes in the hourly wages for these 500 groups between 1980 and 2016. And in the horizontal axis, you have our measure of task displacement. And you can see that there's a very clear negative association between these two variables. So indeed, it is the case that when you look at the data, those groups that our methodology identifies as having experienced the greatest amount of task displacement are precisely the groups that have experienced the lowest wage growth in the last 40 years. It is also quite remarkable that many of these groups with high task displacements experience negative wage growth during this period. So our measure is doing a good job at identifying who are the groups that experience real wage declines during this period. Another point that I wanna make, you can also see here that our measure doesn't do a great job for people with a post-college degree. So you can see that essentially they are experiencing way more wage growth than what our measure would predict. And on Orata, that's going back to your question. So if you wanted to explain this, you need something making these workers more productive over time. And you're gonna see that in the regression tables in a second. Now, one interesting feature is that, well, you might ask, well, how do we know that this is about something that happened in the 80s and that has to do with technology? Maybe these groups have always done poorly. Well, that's not the case. We can also see what was happening to these groups that became subsequently exposed before the 1980s by looking at their wage growth from 1950 to the 1980s. And we can see that during this period, all groups, all groups, including those that subsequently became exposed to automation and experienced wage declines during this period had very healthy wage growth of about 50% during this 30 year period. So that's about 1.5% per year. Fast forward 30 years and those groups now are experiencing 10% uh, decline in their real wages. So I think that that's essentially a key takeaway of this presentation. Before these technologies arrived, we had kind of like this shared prosperity. And when this technology arrives, you have still some wage growth at the top that is comparable to what we had before, but we don't see that wage growth at the bottom anymore. And that coincides precisely with the groups or that's taking place precisely in the groups that our measure identifies as being the most exposed to these task displacement effects from automation. So let me show you this table. And then I'll describe very quickly the quantitative exercise that we do in the paper. And then I'll conclude so that we can open the floor for discussion. So let's focus on columns four, five, and six, which again, use the task displacement measure based on the labor share decline driven by our measures of automation technologies. In column four, what you have is just a regression of changes in wages against these measures without any controls. So you can see that the point estimate is minus 1.65 and is very precisely estimated. So this means that if technology or automation displaces a worker from 10% of their tasks, their relative wages are going to fall by 16%. So this is a sizable effect. More importantly, this single variable explains 65% of the variation in the data. So the R square of this regression, and I mean, you can actually see that from here, the R square of this regression is quite high. And so in a reduced form sense, this measure explains 65% of the way it changes over time. In column five, I'm doing exactly the exercise that Honorata suggested. So here I am controlling for educational dumps. And the reason why I can do that is because I have many more groups and these groups also give me variation in the extent to which they are exposed to automation, even conditional 
on their skills. So for example, when I look at people without a college degree, there are some groups, especially young men of certain races that are more exposed to the displacement effects of automation. So this allows me to identify the effects of task displacement conditional on these measures of a educational dummies. This is important because essentially what we are doing here is controlling for other potential types of technology that are making just college or post-college workers more productive over time. Now you can see two interesting things. First, when you control for education, you still get our effect there, right? It's less precise, but it is still there and actually quite comparable. Second, and more interestingly, when you look at the raw data, the college premium, which is going to be the coefficient on the college dummy, is 25%. But conditional on our measure of task displacement, it falls essentially to zero. So this suggests that our measure of task displacement explains all of the increase in the college premium during this period. The reason being that college workers are less exposed to automation technologies. But the same cannot be said of the past college premium. In the data, the past college premium increased by 40%. And once you control for our measure of task displacement, it only increases by 10%. So here is where you need other types of technologies to explain the big increase in the post-college premium. So that's something that we do not account for, but we think that that's fine because I don't think that we have a good reason to expect automation to be increasing the post-college premium above and beyond the college premium. So I think that if you want to understand that, you need other explanations, for example, the increasing assortative matching between more skilled people and larger firms and so on. Finally, and to quantify the importance of these two types of factors, here we have a decomposition of the R square of the regression in terms of our task displacement measure and these educational dummies. And you can see that our measure of task displacement explains 52% of the variation, whereas the educational dummies explain only 10% of the variation. Okay, so that's kind of like the main takeaway of the paper is essentially a lot of what we have been calling skill bias technical change is really not skill bias technical change in the traditional sense. It's just the fact that low skilled workers are more exposed to automation. And this explanation has huge explanatory power when compared to others and parsimoniously captures the fact that many groups have experienced real wage declines. So let me conclude in kind of like with a two minute summary of what we do in the quantitative exercise in the paper. And this is mostly to get you interested in this so that you can go and, and read the whole thing eventually. So what we do essentially is that we take these estimates and we put them into the model. And we also estimate the ripple effects. And essentially the key idea behind the estimation of the ripple effects is that all I need to know is what happened to the wages of my group when other wages get when, when other workers get displaced. So that's telling me like what's the spillover or what's the ripple effect that that group creates on me. So in principle, you can think of like a huge matrix of a spillover where each group can affect other groups, but we parameterize these spillovers as a function of how similar these groups are in terms of the tasks and industries in which they specialize. And with that parametric assumption, we can estimate this big matrix of spillovers. And with that in hand, we can use our model to compute what's the total effect on wages of automation, now accounting for these spillover effects or these ripple effects. So this figure summarizes the result from that exercise. The first thing that I'm plotting here, and again, I'm doing this ranking or sorting groups against their early wages in the 1980s. And here you have wage changes since 1980 predicted by the model. So the first thing that I'm doing here is plotting the productivity effect. In terms of productivity, the economy expanded because of automation, and that would have increased all of our wages by 45%. So that's great news. Now, in the second panel, I'm plotting the fact that automation also changes the sectoral composition of the economy because it concentrates on manufacturing. And so it shifts value added towards services, and services demand very different skills than manufacturing. We thought that this was going to be an important channel, but turns out that it's not. In particular, these sectoral shifts induced by automation are not big enough in the data. Finally, in panel C, we add the task displacement effects. So this is the negative part. So now we are accounting for the fact that all of these productivity gains came at the expense of groups that were displaced. And so you can see that now 
Some groups, those with a post-college degree, are going to win a lot, but groups that were displaced are going to lose a lot. And all of this is kind of like coming from the model, which is calibrated to match the regressions that I showed you earlier and, and the spillover effects. And finally, in panel D, we add the spillover effects. So imagine that the direct effect of the shock is the one in panel C. What's going to happen is that these groups at the bottom, which are experiencing a huge drop in wages, are then going to start competing against other groups for some of their tasks. And they can do that because their wages are lower now, right? So firms are willing to substitute them. But what this is going to do is that this is going to equalize some of the wage effects of automation. It's going to compress them a little bit. You can think that in the limit, if everyone was able to retrain perfectly and become a computer scientist, then this would imply that all of this dispersion would vanish and we will all converge to the same line because we are not fundamentally different. But the fact that it hasn't suggests that there are some important differences between these groups and that the comparative advantage of these groups across tasks is quite strong. And so when they get displaced from some of the tasks in which they have a comparative advantage, they cannot just go to other tasks and fully lower the wages of those other groups by the same amount. So essentially this is telling us that at least in the US, relocation of groups across tasks has reduced the effects of inequality, but has not fully absorbed all of those differences. So that's my last slide. Let me just conclude by saying that this paper argues that much of the increase in US wage inequality is due to the uneven effects of task displacement. Uh, this is very different from canonical theories of skill bias technical change because we are emphasizing the role of displacement and also the importance of industries and occupations above and beyond educational levels in mediating the effects of technology. Here, what matters is what are the occupations that you do sorry, what are the tasks that you do, not what are your skills? The tasks that you do determine whether you're exposed to automation or not. This theory provides a better fit to the data and has high explanatory power and also explains why productivity growth has been lackluster despite these huge adverse distributional effects and why these types of technologies can lead to declining real wages for some groups of workers as we've seen in the data. So thanks so much.